It's about time to begin, so uh, I will wel welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, some of us that have uh, been under the weather, it's good to uh, see each of you back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've got several announcements here, so I'll move on with that. Uh, also, it's good to see Patrick and Sandy with us this morning. Uh, next Sunday will be our gospel meeting, and uh, it'll, be, it'll begin on Sunday and go through Wednesday. We're looking forward to our speaker coming, and, and he's excited about coming to be with us. Uh, look forward to the lessons and pray for him and pray for, that uh, we can have some folks out of our community here. Uh, also next Sunday, we will have lunch on the grounds, but it's going to be uh, catered. Except if you would like to fix a dessert, uh, we would uh, we would welcome that. But uh, the meal, other than desserts, will be catered, and we look forward to that. On Saturday is our uh, men's meeting. Uh, that that will be at nine o'clock. Uh, tonight uh, we'll have our Sunday evening uh, services. And uh, also for the young people, there will be a, a Genesis class, a class on Genesis started that uh, uh, preparing uh, each of them for the uh, Bible Bowl uh, next year. So look look forward to that. That's uh, something that's uh, new and, and ho hopefully will be exciting. Uh, yesterday, we had a cleanup here at the building and you know, we got we got a, quite a bit done. If you noticed uh, coming in the drive, uh, there's a lot of saplings that are not obstructing the the building. We got those cut down, and then we got uh, pine bark around uh, all our natural. You know, a lot of our natural areas. I think that that looks pretty good. But everybody that turned out, I, I know there was a lot of cleaning that went on in the inside the building. So. Uh, Everybody that, you know, came, we had a lot of fun, uh, maybe a few tales told, and then we uh, did get some good work done. So thank you to uh, everybody that turned out for that. Uh, it certainly looked better for our gospel meeting coming up. Uh, it's good to have Doug with us this morning. We, we've had uh, different ones called in a, or been part of a shutdown, and so we know what that's like, but uh, we have missed him now for several weeks, and hopefully uh, they've got the nuclear plant headed back up and running, and uh, he's going to be back with us now like he's supposed to be. <laughs> Good to have you, Doug. Uh, in the way of prayers, Teresa Bennett's sister, Shirley, has COVID, so that stuff's still going around a little bit, so keep uh, Shirley in our prayers. Uh, Miranda, uh, prayers for her husband's health. His name is Charles, so keep him in our prayers. Uh, Jody was with us on Thursday morning, but he's sick today. So uh, I know they had quite a bit of company coming in, and he was doing some projects, getting ready for that. So keep uh, Jody and uh, Letitia and that family in your prayers. Um, <clears throat> Hannah, Andy's wife, has developed high blood pressure, and that's uh, Roger and Melinda's uh, uh, daughter-in-law, Hannah. And of course, Hannah and, and Andy went to church with us for quite a while, but keep uh, Hannah in her prayers, and, and uh, seemed like everything was going pretty good, and then, then this happened. So uh, uh, keep uh, Hannah and the baby and, and Andy in our prayers. LaShonda, uh, her, just keep her family in our prayers. Uh, Mark. It's good to have him back with us again this Sunday, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, the way I understand it's still gradual recuperating, so I uh, want to continue to uh, pray for him. We've been praying for uh, David Jones uh, up at the, what, the Tri-City Schools, uh, one of the uh, professors up there, teachers, uh, keep him in our prayers as he'll be going to Texas uh, for his cancer treatment. I think that's coming up uh, real fast. 
that's quite a few announcements, but that, that's all I had, uh, especially remember the gospel meeting next week. Uh, we look forward to that and want to pray, pray for that. I will uh, offer a prayer and we will begin. May we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, pretty sunshine this day. We thank you for the many uh, pleasures of life that we enjoy. We thank you for the good health that allows us to be part of this worship service this morning. Father, uh, we, we pray for our service. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have in a, in a free country to come worship you. Father, uh, we pray for all those that have been mentioned on our list that are sick or afflicted. We pray that you will be with them, be with their families, be with uh, the doctors, the medical staff that's working with them. Pray during this time, Father, that all will look to you. Father, uh, as we go through our service, uh, we pray that uh, you help us to uh, be alert and learn from what uh, is being said and uh, that we may be better examples of you in our everyday lives. Father, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you would, take out a song book and turn with me to number 47. Four, seven. Would you please go ahead and turn in Mark number 887? 887. We'll use 887 later following our lesson. And now, if you would, number 191. Following this song, we're taking the Lord's Supper together. One, nine, one.
Good morning. If you do not currently have a, um, a communion set, please let us know by raising your hand. Okay. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us in so many ways that we cannot possibly number. We do not have time to number all the blessings that you have given us. Most of all, Father, at this time we are, we are mindful of the sacrifice that was made so that we who are undeserving may have a chance at salvation, may have a chance to live the rest of our eternal life with you. Father, at this time, our minds turn towards the body that was, that was beaten and was, was put up on the cross on our behalf. And we thank you so much for that sacrifice. And I ask, Father, that uh, you accept this as praise to you and, and, and turn our minds to that time and that sacrifice and what it means to us individually, Father. Pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Please bow with me. Father, our minds now turn to that blood, that blood that was so precious, the blood of your son, the blood that covers our sins and cleans our souls and, and gives the world, every person in this world, a chance for salvation. Father, as we uh, take this, I pray that we do this in a way that is acceptable in your sight and, and, and that our minds turn back to that that sacrifice and that and that we live in a way that is honors that sacrifice, Father. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. At this time, we're also like to express our gratitude to God for the physical blessings, of course. And uh, this is a time where we talk about how we can return uh, some of what he's blessed us with back to him for the work and worship of the church. And um, please bow with me as I express our thanks to God for that. Thank you, Father, for blessing us physically, Father, for the jobs that we have or the income that we have and how we support ourselves and our children and Father, I ask that uh, you take these funds that we've set aside and, and you use them in ways that, um, that benefit uh, yourself and that benefits uh, this congregation and be with the men who decide who, where these funds go and, and guide us, Father, and help us to, to do so wisely in a way that honors you. Pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I'll be reading verses 28 and 29. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I wish to God that whether in a short time or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to see some who are uh, here this morning who are visiting with us as well as others who maybe have been away for a little bit. It's good to see you back. Uh, you know, today is extra special for us in many ways because today is Mother's Day. I want to begin by saying Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms 
and grandmothers, uh, great-grandmothers that are here. I'm so thankful for your life and what you do uh, each day with your little ones. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> uh, this morning or this week, uh, you know, there were a lot of men running around trying to find flowers and little gifts. Uh, some of us maybe at the last minute, others of us maybe a little bit more ahead of time. But uh, in all of these things, we just want you to know how much we appreciate you. I think it's kind of interesting that in our class this morning, we were studying about women of faith, right? And uh, I was uh, talking with Lisa afterwards, and it's, uh, or uh, Miss Virginia, I think, was actually said this uh, in class. But, uh, you know, in, within the Word of God, God elevates women, as he does men. He, he elevates all of us. Um, uh, and all of us are special in his eyes. And when we consider his great blessings. Uh, this last week, Friday, I had a, a really wonderful occasion. Now, she's not here today, unfortunately. She has to be traveling. But Miss Betty uh, was talking to me. Actually, she brought it up Thursday. She said, you know, after I've been studying, um, you know, I... I I need to be baptized. And so uh, I said, well, we can go do it right now if you need to. But uh, she couldn't do it right that minute. But it left such a burning place in her heart and a desire. She called me Friday morning. And she's like, if you have time, I really need to do it today. And I was like, certainly. Let's get it taken care of. And that's what we did Friday. Now, some of you may remember not too long ago, she was baptized uh, at the meeting in Cary. And that may make your mind think, well, why would she be doing that again? Well, this is from her, and this is why I think it's so wonderful. You know, after she was, um, uh, after that meeting in Cary, she continued to study her Bible. And as she continued to study, what she came to realize on her own uh, it was after studying passages like First uh, Second Thessalonians one eight and then other passages that she had not really been baptized before, as in immersed into Christ. That she had felt she'd gotten wet, but she hadn't really done what God had wanted her to do, and that she knew that uh, before her mind was like I was saved, and then as a result of that I was baptized. But what she came to understand was is that baptism is more significant than that. Not, not that there's anything important about water. There's nothing special about the water back here. It was ice cold. Uh, like, um, you know, I always feel bad when somebody's going in there. I'm like, but, uh, but what it does for you spiritually is so significant. And she understood that more. And it was such a powerful example to me about how how when we come to God and, and we, we read and understand how it has the power to change our lives and how important and significant it is uh, of becoming a Christian and being immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what she came to realize. And she knew she could not wait another moment. She had to take care of it right then. And I was telling her afterwards, it's like, and she was talking about, you know, I, I don't mean to make a big fuss, you know, I've been baptized when I was a child and, and then recently, but, and here I'm doing it again, but I said this, I said, no, this is the first time you're really being baptized into Christ, and that's the thing you need to get your mind around, and I want you to remember that and hold on to that. I thought, what a wonderful example of someone who, who was almost persuaded but not fully convinced. And then after she became fully convinced, that desire became so apparent in her heart, she had to take care of it. And so this morning, what I would like to spend a little time on, and please, when Miss Betty comes back, you, let's all wrap our arms around her and, and tell her what a powerful example she's left for us. But I, I was thinking about that and, and thinking about texts like, Acts 26. Thank you, Duane, for reading that, that passage with us. 
But if you go back there and you remember just for a minute what's going on, you have uh, Paul who has been falsely imprisoned, uh, who had to appeal to his Roman citizenship in order to sustain his life and avoid a terrible situation, has now been in prison for a while um, and is now being brought um, before a man named King Agrippa and his wife Bernice and, and Festus. And you can go back there and read that text, but Paul defends not himself in that text, but, but his faith, his Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. And you may remember at one point in that message in Acts 26 that Festus calls up and he says, Paul, you've gone mad. All your learning has driven you mad. And Paul says to him, I I'm not mad as you suppose. And then he turns to King Agrippa, who was supposed to be the king of the Jews, although we really know who the real king is. And then he focuses on King Agrippa. And after this dialogue, King Agrippa says in verse 28, he said to Paul, in a short time, this is the English Standard Translation, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul responded, whether, in sh whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. These chains. Paul understood the significance of what the gospel meant for him and for the world. And his desire, as he says to the Corinthians, you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, what does he say? I, I, I didn't want to know anything among you except for these two things, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was the drive in Paul's life. And as he's standing here before, uh, before King uh, Herod Agrippa and, and, and these other uh, litany of people, his desire for was the same as it was with the Corinthians. That the gospel of Christ be taught and heard and responded to. That, that it not be something that King Agrippa almost becomes a Christian, but that he becomes fully convinced of the power of the blood of Jesus to forgive sins. The power it has to move us, to change us. Unfortunately, King Agrippa went away that day, and there's no record of him ever converting to Christianity. Now, we have a record that, that there were those who would continue to come to Paul from that court, but, uh, but for selfish reasons. But none of them, to my knowledge, ever became children of God. And I think that's so unfortunate. And so, as we think about this... I. I want to ask the question, you know, how, how do I or, or someone I'm studying with move from being almost persuaded to being fully convinced? Now, there may be someone in this room this morning who's not a Christian, and I, and I really want you to hear this. This message is, is especially for you, but it's also for those of us who maybe are Christians who are not living like we should, those who who claim Christianity but have never really been fully convinced in, in this way, that I haven't really patterned my life after Jesus, that I've not really made the changes that I should, that, that Christian is a name I wear, but it's not really who I am. How do I move from being almost persuaded to fully convinced? I want to give you a couple ideas here that I think are important. Number one, and... And this is number one because this is the starting place. That in order to be fully convinced, I must be open to hearing the truth. You know, it, uh, we have a lot of things going on right now in our culture. Uh, from what's going on on our college campuses to, to what's going on in our society. And we have so many countering ideas that are coming against one another and you'll often see two people, and I've seen this at college campuses, 
seems like in the news every day, where, where you have one group yelling one thing and, and another group yelling something else. But what's not going on in either group? Nobody's listening. The, you have your mantra, the thing you're yelling. The other person has the thing they're yelling. But nobody's actually listening. You know, change never happens in somebody's life until we begin to listen. It has to become out of a need, out of a self-motivated need to make change, to, to be honest with who we are, where we are, and, and, and the direction of our life. You know, I, I think about what's going on in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, you have that wonderful Christian example of Stephen, this man who has, who has devoted his life since becoming a Christian to being a Christian and proclaiming his Christianity. And as he is brought up on, uh, in this mock trial and, and he's given an opportunity to defend himself. And you go read Acts 7. That, that's his defense, not of himself again, but of his faith in Christ. You'll not hear him one time say, I didn't do, or I'm not to blame, or I'm innocent. He never says any of those words. But what does he do? He defends his, his faith in Christ. And what's the reaction of the crowd? Well, in verse 54, the text says that they were just simply enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Were they listening? maybe they were hearing the words he was saying, but they weren't really listening with an open heart. The text goes on to say that after looking up into heaven and seeing Jesus at the right hand of God and telling, verse 56, telling the people that that's what I'm seeing, verse 57 says that they cried out with a loud voice and notice this, stopped their ears and rush together at him. You know, I can't help but think about a young child when they no longer want to hear what you have to say, and maybe they're having a meltdown, and they cover their ears as though what you're saying cannot penetrate them and cannot get into their mind. They're just not going to listen. And in this text, we see a bunch of adults behaving like young children, who simply refused to hear. There's not a word Stephen could have said that day to convince them. You know why? Is it because of the lack of the power of the words of God, of the Holy Spirit? No. It's because they just simply refused to hear. The student who refuses to be a student will never learn anything. You know, you sit down with somebody and you're trying to Teach them something. You ever had this experience? You ever been on the other side of this? I know I have. Where the teacher is trying, the, the person who's trying to teach me a new skill or, or teach me something, and I'm sitting there trying to then tell them how to do it. Oh, but well, what about this? This happens sometimes at our home with our little boys. And they're like, they'll start asking me questions about things. And then when I start to try to tell them, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. What about this? What if you did this? No, no, you need to do it this way. You need... I was like, didn't you come to me and ask me for help? And I'm like, obviously you know what to do, so I'm going to just walk away and let you handle it. When we don't have an openness of heart and mind to learn, we're never going to grow. When we think we've got it all figured out, it's never going to move beyond that. You have a contrasting example in Acts chapter 2, don't you? You have a very similar circumstance. Here you have the apostles getting up, and again, they're defending their faith. They're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have a group of people who could have been very hostile, and I'm sure there were some in that crowd that day who were very hostile, who, when Peter's preaching... He has some very strong words for them, some very condemning words. Like if you go to um, chapter 2 and verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel know 
uh, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You killed an innocent man. Not only that, you killed the Son of God. That's on your hands. You did that. Now, when in Acts 7 they heard a similar message, they didn't react with very open heart, did they? However, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 37, we see these individuals responding with an open heart and mind. The text says they heard, notice that, underline that, they heard, and then what? They were cut to the heart. And then they said to the Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were open to hearing God. They were open to hearing from God. And so they were able to move beyond that. Romans ten seventeen tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. You notice the first step there is the hearing, listening. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 tells us that um, Jesus gives us a parable of the wise man. The wise man built his house on what? I bet all of our young people know that song very well. He built his house upon the sand. No, he built his house upon the rock. When those rains fell, when the winds blew, it didn't fall, did it? Because it was built on the rock. But the wise man is the man who knows to listen for instruction, the instruction from God. So if I'm ever going to move from being almost persuaded to fully convinced, I need to have a willingness to hear, an openness to hear the truth. Number two, being fully convinced follows from an understanding of the truth. I know there are a lot of those who attack the truth and say there is no objective truth. However, that's not the message of the word of God. That's not even what we all know to be true in our own lives. You know there are certain things that are just objectively true. There are certain things that are not left up to my subjective interpretation and when the stove is on those eyes are hot every time I touch them it's the same reaction I've never seen a stove top that had cold eyes unless it was turned off in Romans chapter 10 Paul says Romans 10 and verse 1 brothers my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a, notice this, a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. Believes what? The truth. They have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. There are a lot of zealous people in the religious world. A lot of people whose zeal could be something we should be inspired by. As Christians, can we have that same kind of zeal? Should we have that same kind of zeal? Absolutely. Absolutely. Some of us have some very cold hearts, need to be warmed up. But zeal without knowledge of the truth is a zeal going nowhere in a hurry. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, Jesus said, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If, that conditional word, if, it comes up over and over in Scripture. If you abide in my word. So if we're not in the word of God, what does that say? I'm not a disciple. 
In order to be a disciple of Jesus means that I abide, I live in the word of God, in Jesus' word. Again, you notice Mark chapter 16. In giving the Great Commission, Mark 16 and verse 15, Jesus said, Go! Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. That's your command, disciples. You go. And then he goes on to say, He who what? Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, but whoever does not believe... What? The gospel will be condemned. Again, another conditional statement upon those who hear the gospel, who hear the truth. How do they respond to it? Uh, We have an interesting example in Acts chapter 19. This applies with Miss Betty we were talking about earlier. In Acts chapter 19, Paul comes to uh, Cor- uh, Corinth, I'm sorry, not Corinth, Ephesus, my bad. Uh, he comes to Ephesus, Paulus had went to Corinth. And the text tells us in verse 2 that while he was there, uh, verse 1, he found some disciples, some, some uh, claiming to be Christians, those who were trying to be followers of Jesus. However, there's a problem. Um, He says in verse 2, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. What were they lacking? Knowledge of the truth, weren't they? But that wasn't all they had not heard of. He goes on in verse 3 to tell us into what, uh, he goes on to ask them, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with, uh, uh, with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And then notice the response. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here are a group of men who had been baptized, right? They'd gotten uh, wet in baptism, uh, in John's baptism, which before Christ was the commanded baptism, yet now on the other side of the cross, you have a group of men who were not right with God. Why were they not right? It's because they had not obeyed the truth. They had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And so how did they respond to that? Being fully convinced, I must have an openness to hear the truth. Being fully convinced, um, I must um, gain an understanding of what truth is. And then there needs to be some action on my part, isn't there? Being fully convinced demands immediate action. These men in Acts 19, what happened here? In the text. Here are a group of men who have zeal, not according to knowledge, then gain knowledge. And the text tells us, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They did what God had called them to. They didn't wait around um, for some time later, but they went ahead and took care of it. Now, I grew up attending some denominational churches. I, I, when I was younger, I went to the Pentecostal church. <clears throat> Later on, I attended a Baptist church. And I remember growing up and, again, having a zeal, but not according to knowledge, believing I was saved. I had responded to the altar call. I, I did what they told me I needed to do. I came down and, okay, everything's great, right? I attended there for a while, several years, but never being baptized. Now, I remember there were some who had been. I remember the practice there in that little church was every so often, maybe once a quarter, once a year, they would collect all the people who wanted to be baptized, and they would take them and and baptize them. 
That was my experience. That's what I knew. That's what you did, right? A zeal not according to knowledge. Later in my life, I learned the truth. I had some wonderful people who shared God's word with me, who inspired me to go and continue studying. What happened as a result of that? I gained knowledge that I wasn't saved, that I wasn't right with God, that what I thought I was was not who I really was. That demanded immediate action. Not a waiting until some later date to take care of this, but this was something I needed to take care of now. That's why I love the example of Miss Betty. She couldn't wait any longer. She knew she had something to do, and it needed to be taken care of. You know, you had the example of Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember he's traveling along, and God, the Holy Spirit, sends Philip to him. He joins him in the chariot. And there's this eunuch who's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 34 tells us the eunuch then asked Philip, who who is this talking about? It says, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Here's a man who had zeal, I mean a man who had made a very long trip to Jerusalem thinking he was doing what God wanted him to do. He had a zeal, not according to knowledge, but a man who had an openness to the truth to hear it. The text tells us in verse 35, at beginning at this scripture, Philip did what? That Philip told him the good news, the gospel about Jesus. And I just love this. Verse 36 says, as they were moving along the road, the eunuch is listening and then he sees a body of water. He hears the gospel. He hears the plan of salvation that's delivered within scripture. And this man knows he's got a need. That there is a problem in his life that needs to get taken care of. You know, how many of us this morning, if we got a call on our phone or an alert through our security system that there was a problem, that there was smoke at our home, how many of us would not get up immediately and see what was going on? Who, if we were at a concert somewhere or or a game or, or out and about with friends, have got some kind of alert like that, would not need to interrupt what was going on in our life, to take care of that need. I know a couple of weeks ago, I got an alert from our security system that our alarm was going off. I got a little bit anxious. Now, come to find out, I put it on the wrong setting and our dog was just moving in the house and set the alarm off. I was very happy to get that alert. But at first, I was a little nervous I was like, what's going on? It's the middle of the day. I was checking out the cameras, right? What, what, what is this? What, what's going on? Because we understand that there's an attachment we have to our home. And we want to make sure things are taken care of there. Now, when you consider your soul, how insignificant is our home compared to our soul? And yet so many leave that undealt with. This eunuch in Acts chapter 8 did not wait a minute to take care of a need he had. I'm a sinner and Jesus is the way to salvation. See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse 37 tells us that Philip said, well, if you believe, then you may. And that eunuch, I can imagine, in a very excited, anxious way, said, Yeah, I I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And the text tells us that they stopped that chariot right then and there, out in the middle of the wilderness. They both went down to that water, and Philip baptized him that day. 
that man went away rejoicing because he knew where his soul was headed. He had a zeal now. He had a zeal according to knowledge. Had a zeal according to knowledge. You know, we asked some in here today, you're in a desperate situation if you're outside of Christ. You're one who's still in their sins. I asked the same question that Ananias asked Paul. Saul at the time, when Paul is recounting this in, in Acts twenty two sixteen, and I said to Saul, why are you waiting? Why tarriest thou? What's taking so long? You know you have a need. You've heard the truth. Why are you putting this off? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Saul had a need. And the only way to deal with it was through Jesus Christ. Being fully convinced moves us from a place of inaction to immediate action. Being fully convinced compels us then to live Faithfully unto the end. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 21, the text tells us in Luke 9, 21, that Jesus has shared with the apostles that he's going to die. Uh, he's, verse 22, he, or verse 21, he warns them not to go and tell people, not to tell people what? Verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That's the context that we get to with those very popular verses in verses 23 and following. He goes on from saying, this is what I'm going to have to endure. This is what's awaiting me. And then he says in verse 23, if anyone would follow after me, if anybody would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever would lose his life for my sake will save it. Losing your life for Jesus. Losing your life for Jesus and giving ourselves over to him totally is the way in which you and I can save our lives. Jesus gave all for us. What are we willing to give to him? In Revelation chapter 2, the text tells us that there's a church in Smyrna, a church in Smyrna that is struggling, that is under heavy persecution. The text tells us that God, in verse number 9, says, I know your poverty, I'm sorry, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And those who slander, uh, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews or not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Difficult times on the horizon for the church in Smyrna. This is going to be a time for them to decide who is it that they are devoted to, themselves or to Jesus. It's a time of testing. We are living in a time of testing. And we have to make a choice. Who will we serve, ourselves or God? He goes on in verse 10 to say, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the call of the gospel. To give ourselves totally over to Jesus. Not to be almost persuaded, to, but to be fully and wholly convinced of the power of the gospel. This morning, as we are here and we we give you an opportunity to respond, to hear 
with an open heart and mind to the gospel. To know that without Christ I am lost. I am without hope in this world. But in Christ there is hope and there is forgiveness. And in Christ I can know that I am saved. 1 John 5, 13. Are you in Christ? First, to those who've never been baptized into Christ, know this, that your life, your soul's eternity is at stake. What will you do with Jesus? Will you continue to ignore him, to ignore the power of the gospel, to ignore its, its ability to change your destiny? Or this morning, will you choose to be fully convinced to be among those who believed and were baptized for salvation. Mark 16, 16. For those of us who are Christians, who though we went through the motions of what it means to obey the gospel, yet have not lived a life of full persuasion of being fully convinced. There's an opportunity for you to respond to respond to the call of the gospel, to respond to the call of the word of God, to be fully dependent and dedicated to Jesus. This morning, can we help you in obeying the gospel and doing what God has called you to do? If you can, please come as together we stand and as we sing.
with me, please. Dear Father, we're thankful for uh, this opportunity that we've had to be here this morning. Thank you for each one uh, that has come. We're mindful of those uh, who wanted to be here and are unable for whatever reason. We'd ask that you would bless them. Father, we thank you for uh, the word that we have. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you. Help us um, not to be partially committed, Father. Help us always to walk with you, to give ourselves over to you, to allow you to lead us and to take care of us. Help us to honor you and glorify you in all that we do, all that we say. Help us to keep things in perspective, Father, in this world and not to be distracted by uh, the many temptations and the many things that can take our energy uh, in the name of good. Uh, help us to stay focused on, on uh, what you would have us to do uh, that is truly good. Help us to support one another. We thank you for this congregation that meets here. Uh, please strengthen each and every one, uh, whether it's physically, uh, mentally, spiritually, Father. Uh, that we might always encourage each other to good works. We thank you for your son, the mercy, and the blessings that we have through him each and every day. Help us not to take uh, that for granted, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.